or surrender. We are soldiers till we die. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Victory is our battle cry. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join our happy throng. We're blood washed, born again believers, and we sing a joyful song. King Jesus is our mighty captain, and it's him we shall obey. We're on the battlefield for Jesus, winning souls for Christ today. So must ever be lost. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw Good me evening and welcome and to Cornerstone Baptist Church this Wednesday evening. Glad to have each and every one of you for midweek service. Please take your maroon hymnals, maroon hymnals. 877 will be our first hymn this evening, 877. This world is not my home. Please stand as we open up in song. 877, This World is Not My Home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid on somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, yeah, that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I see it in hand. He's waiting up for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angel beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise straight back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friends.
heaven like you. If heaven is not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Let's remain standing as we go to God in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here another evening. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be in your house. Lord, we just thank you for that, the words to that song, Lord, as we, we think about where you brought us from, Lord. And there's so many times, Lord, that we can uh, reflect and, and see, Lord, that uh, we was, uh, had things as, as idols and, and put things before you, Lord. But now, Lord, as you changed our heart and you saved us, Lord, we should see the world different. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that we see the world as, as, as passing by, Lord, and, and not being our home. Lord, if we're comfortable here, Lord, that, that means something's not right. So, Lord, I pray that our hearts be right towards you. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to just get rid of anything that we put in front of you. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to uh, show us, Lord, that uh, your word is true when it talk about uh, what the profit of man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we put the things of God first. So, Lord, we just thank you. I pray our hearts be open to the preaching. Lord, we give Pastor Lewis the liberty to preach your word. And, and Lord, I pray, Lord, that we uh, be convicted and uh, just want to be better. Lord, we just thank you. We honor you. And we praise you for all the things you've given us and all these things I ask in Jesus Christ. Amen. 856. Oh, it is wonderful. 856 as we continue in song this evening. Life has purpose now it never had had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For joy and peace I can explain is mine. Since I found I knew it. Hold up. All right, let's play that from the top again. Piano, can you play it through? No support of this. From the top. Verse 1. Life has purpose now it never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. Oh, it's wonderful to be a Christian. Wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. I can go directly to the Lord in prayer. He has told me I may boldly enter there, and He listens. I plead. I find mercy there and grace for every need. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. And the hope of heaven's glory thrills me so. Where I 
Father, Lord, God, we're so thankful to be in your house this evening. God, what a breakaway Lord, in the middle of the week, God, to be able to come and just hear strong Bible preaching, Lord, and to fellowship, and Lord, just to be encouraged, Lord, through the week. God, I pray that you be with Pastor, give him the power, give him your wisdom. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts, convict us, Lord, on these matters of uh, really, God, modesty, whether it be man or woman, God modesty. And God, as Christians, we ought to want to align ourselves with the Bible, not with man, but with you. And so, God, I pray that you would bless this message, God. I pray, God, that you would just continue to bless our church, continue to use our church, Lord, in the, in the various ministries, Lord, that we have here, God. We thank you for them. And God, we thank you for our church building. We thank you, Lord, that as Christians, God, we have a work, Lord, that we can be a part of that really matters. And so, God, you bless our offerings. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We are not having nursery tonight, and so we're going to keep the little ones in here. And if they get animated and become a distraction, just take them for a little walk, feed them a cheeseburger, and uh, bring them back when they're ready to settle down and be quiet. But just uh, help with uh, recognizing if they're being a distraction and then take them for a little walk. Take your Bible and go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're looking at trends. Trends in fundamental Baptist churches. Trends of appearance. 
A couple Wednesday nights ago, we dealt with short skirts and skirts getting shorter and shorter and shorter in our churches. And tonight, we're going to look at the leggings look. The leggings look. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us that we can apply a test to anything, anything we do. The Bible even uses the word all to describe that which we are able to test. And all means all. That's all all can mean. And so God's word can even test the leggings look. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 21, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove how many things? All. 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 And so that's what we desire to do through these sessions is to prove not just some things, um, not just the things that we like, if I say, well, let's prove if we should have uh, a potluck dinner. Yeah, not hard to pass that test. But when you start talk, talking about sensitive stuff, then we start questioning if all really means all. But all means all. And so God's word tells us to test all things. And that's what we want to do. But let's ask God's blessing as we do. Father, I ask that you would help us not to test without your Holy Spirit guiding and superintending the service. Father, I pray that our commitment would be to your word, not man's opinion, but to your word. I pray that our commitment would be to the truth, and that we would also be desirous of following you and not the worldly trends as they crop up around us and in many cases, lead us closer to the world. Help us, Lord, not to be fooled or deceived by these things. Lord, I also pray that we would settle the issue of the heart when it comes to appearance and dress. Lord, I ask especially for our new Christians that they would understand uh, that many of us have been here for years and we've been saved for a while and we've, we've studied your word and we, we've made some decisions and we're, we've taken a certain position but Lord, I pray that there would be much grace for the baby Christians in our midst to grow and to arrive um, at a proper understanding of your word and let you deal with their hearts. And so Lord, I just pray for liberty tonight and boldness. I also pray that if there's someone here tonight that's not saved, may they hear the old, old story and be born again. Even tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever heard the story of the frog that was placed in a pot of cool water? You ever hear that story? The frog, he liked the water, and he was very happy. The water was cool and refreshing, just like swimming on a hot summer's day. But then gradually, that pot that was on top of a stove was heated up slowly and gradually. And it went from a day at the swimming pool to a soothing hot tub bath. Boy, it helped that frog's aches and pains, but he wondered what happened to the cool, cool, refreshing pool. But it felt good. And it was heating up so slow that the water got close to boiling. And the frog was in great danger, but he didn't know it. He had no clue because it was getting warmer and warmer until it got hot and hot, little by little, until he became frog soup. That is how clothing styles are today. And that's what the worldly fashions due to the Christian, just little by little, little by little, until your Christian frog suit. Now in Bible days, um, and in Victorian days, 
And even in early America, we could think of Laura Ingalls Wilder type of early America. Women wore long dresses. They were loose and normally very modest. Now the clothing of today is much more comfortable and is easier to care for, but the problem are the extremes. The extremes, you could talk about Victorian England or go back to Bible days, or you could talk about today, extremes, that's the problem. You see, back in Victorian days, women covered up almost everything. And today, the fashions of our day cover up almost nothing. You see the extremes? That didn't happen overnight. Like the frog in the water, we have gradually gotten used to the clothing styles of our day that are much more tantalizing and much more revealing, much more on the edge. Frogs are stupid. They don't have a soul. But God created us different. We have a soul, and before that frog knows it, they're stuck in boiling water. And I'm here to say tonight, you don't have to be that way. I've got four daughters, and I don't want my girls to be like frogs in a pot. Their mother and I determined a long time ago that we wanted a certain type of child. We wanted to raise a certain type of child. Not just someone that would hear the gospel and be saved, but someone that would grow up and become a strong, independent, old-fashioned fundamental Baptist. And I don't want my daughters making changes in the way they dress just because it's the trend of that day. That's not a good enough reason. Now, a trend is a general direction of something. The word trend and the word fashion are very similar to each other. That trend, we said this last week, may or may not be inherently wrong, but typically the trends of our day when it comes to fashion leads to worldliness. And we said that pastors need to see trends. Pastors, if nobody else sees trends, pastors must because they stand in the pulpit and they try to preach to keep God's people out of the messes of the world. Trends. Now this is what I see happening with the leggings look. This trend with strong Baptists having a, a skirt on, maybe a modest skirt, and leggings underneath that show the calf, that show the skin down to the ankle, or show that, that bottom part, that's relatively new in our ranks. I can't speak for all circles, but that is relatively new in our ranks, and I feel as if the Lord would have me to address it. And um, the gospel is paramount, salvation, and you know I preach the gospel. Prayer is very, very important. And you know I believe in preaching on prayer and the Holy Spirit. But I also believe that a pastor should open his mouth about other things that could potentially hinder the growth of the people under his care. And so we should address different topics. You take him for a little walk, Alex little walk <laughs> feed him a cheeseburger lost my train of thought <laughs> but trends but I feel the Lord would have me to dress it this is what I was about to say excuse me if sometimes the nature of my teaching takes on the form of a sermon. I'm a preacher. And when I get up to try to teach, um, no doubt my, 
lessons turn into sermons. So I would say that's just the way that I am. But I do want to teach. I do want you to learn in this ministry. But it's like a man that he's used to drawing red horses. That all he, For a living, he draws red horses. And then somebody hires him to draw a panda. And he says, well, I'll draw that panda, but it's going to look like a red horse. I'll teach, but invariably it's going to come out looking like a sermon by the time we're done. It is possible for men to dress immodestly too. And I think that that's something we need to remember and consider. Recently at Bob Jones University, the staff allowed them to do something that has that, that shocked me, that, that was never a part of their founding. Old Bob Jones Sr. was a true, I underline true fundamentalist. Uh, Dr. Vogelin trained underneath that institution when Bob Jones Sr. was still there. It is not the same place. They recently had a fashion show with the runway um, and, and models that went up and down the runway. And, and they got in a lot of hot water because of some pastors that really... Some pastors with a little bit of a backbone that took them the task over it, they were depicting the passion of Christ. It was blasphemous. And they had this effeminate man, this cross-dressing effeminate man with a coat that was supposed to represent the robe of Christ walking down the runway. It was wicked. But men can be, be immodest as well. I would admit it's a little bit more complicated for women. Girls and ladies typically care more about how they look. As girls get older, they try harder to impress, and they have more options. Uh, typically, they have more options. Now, if a guy is a real guy, if a man is a real man, he doesn't have quite the variety of garments that women have at their disposal. You just compare how much space in a department store is dedicated to men's clothing and how much space is dedicated to women's clothing. Now, I'm the father, as I said, of four girls. And I deeply desire for them to understand God's will for their life concerning modesty so that they can please God in this area my job to pass that on to them it's not it's I don't believe it's it's God's will for me to be convinced of these things in scripture and then to, to, to raise someone that'll just turn their back on everything they were taught in their home now modesty is more than just a change of clothes and every time we've talked about this sensitive subject I at least to my recollection, I have stressed that it is a matter of the heart and that the heart needs to be right. I also want to say that I don't believe that God wants us to judge the motives of another Christian. You don't know that person's heart. A person may be doing something and to our appearance it may be that they're uh, willfully sinning, but we we don't know their heart. And by the way, the Bible forbids us to judge the heart and motives of other people. But, but, we can and should accurately judge people's words and actions by this book. 've heard myself back there. Let me suggest a book, if you're a, a baby Christian, if you're a new Christian wondering, what does the Bible have to say about dress? Much of what I'm going to say tonight um, may not completely make sense to you, but if you'll read a book, I think it would help you, okay? Uh, a couple books. One is Dress, A Matter of the Heart by Shirley Starr, and uh, I would read that one first, and then secondly, I would read Dr. David Cloud's book entitled Dressing for the Lord. It goes into a lot of detail about what the Bible has to say about dress. I want to give you some biblical points. Number one, a command. A command or a principle. 
Now, what, what is, this is teaching time, what is the difference between a command and a principle? A command is much more specific. A principle can be applied. God's word has commands, and it also has principles. For instance, there is no command in the Bible that says that you shouldn't smoke crack cocaine. There's, you won't find it. You can start in Genesis and go all the way to Revelation. If you find it, let me know. But I, I haven't found it yet. There's no command. But there are lots of principles that would lead any sincere reader of the Bible to the conclusion that you ought not to smoke crack cocaine. Principles. There's commands. There's principles. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, a picture book would have been handy, but God in his infinitely perfect wisdom gave us words instead of pictures. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. Second Timothy 3, 16. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We've got to be concerned about the commands of God and the principles of God. True modesty comes from someone that is more concerned about showing the world how great God is than how great she is. That's real modesty. True modesty doesn't come from having your wardrobe right. It comes from having your heart right. But when your heart is right, really right, make no mistake about it, it will affect your wardrobe. A changed heart through salvation doesn't have to be swayed by trends. You don't have to be tossed about with every wind or trend that comes along the way. And so a command, of course we're going to say that we should obey the commands of God. And I'll illustrate each point as we go through the lesson tonight. Here's a command, an example of a command. Be modest, be discreet, and be distinct. I could argue each one of those as commands from the Word of God, and I would argue them, I would fight for them. I'd like to think I would die for the commands of God, which include be modest, be discreet, and be distinct. Number two, a conviction. We looked at a command. A conviction. A conviction means I am fully persuaded about something. Okay, and biblically speaking, it is because of a command, I am fully persuaded. The command is God's. The conviction is the response in my heart to the command of God. A conviction. This requires study. You can't be a robot and have real convictions. You can't just sign a piece of paper so you can serve in the bus ministry and say that you've got convictions. You can't just put it on like it's a uniform from McDonald's and say you have convictions. It takes some getting into God's word, some study, and some thought. This is why I say, get in the book. See what it says. Go with me to Psalm chapter 119. Modesty needs to be a matter of conviction. Conviction. If it's just a command, it stays in the Bible. If it becomes a conviction... It enters your heart. And friend, when it's yours, nobody can take it away from you. Modesty needs to be a conviction. Psalm 119, verse number 11. 
Psalm 119, verse number 11. Thy word have I hid in the Bible. It's there where it's supposed to be. No, that's not what it says. Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. There must be a conviction. And then watch me now. Then, then there needs to be the fear of God to cause you to act on that conviction. Go with me to Mark chapter 1. Now, preferences are influenced by what others say and think. That's a preference. But convictions are influenced by what God says. And for there to be a heart ready to have convictions, there needs to be salvation. Salvation has to take place. If somebody's not willing to approach the Bible and look for convictions, I question their salvation. They're unwilling to look for convictions. That's why I think so many people in sound Bible-believing churches are not truly born again. They've not been changed by the Spirit of God. Listen, I do not stand before you here as a perfect man, but I know that I'm saved. And when I got saved, God started dealing in my heart, and I said, whatever, whatever, you show me in your word that something is a command, and I'll form a conviction about it. And if somebody doesn't have that type of heart, I question their salvation. You didn't get what I got. Mark chapter 1, verse number 15. Mark 1, 15, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repentance means to change your view about sin. And, 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 and when you do that, what used to seem fun and acceptable is now something that you see that God hates and you want to hate it too. And when that's not there, I question the salvation. And so, again, I want to illustrate using the same command to start out with. The command example is God says be modest, discreet, and distinct. Now, who says that? God. The conviction says I will be modest, distinct, and discreet. I should and I will. Now it's a conviction, a conviction. So a command, a conviction, and then a confine or a standard, a confine. A standard, you say, what is a standard? We preach standards at Cornerstone Baptist Church. We believe in standards. And I've preached them. I, I thought it was wise the first full year to just preach the gospel and, 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 and try to evangelize. I didn't preach much on standards for that first year. But when God gave us members, I started to preach on standards. I don't, I don't back off from preaching on standards. But a standard is simply something that helps me to keep the conviction that I say I have. Okay, if you don't have the conviction, why are you holding on to the standard? You need to, you need to answer that question to yourself. But a standard is just a fence that helps me to keep the conviction that is based on a command. Think of a standard as a fence protecting a house. The house is the real thing. The fence is there to protect the real thing. A standard may not be a command, but it's there to protect the command. Are you following me? That's a standard. Now, when you desire to please God, you will not be interested in seeing how close can I get to that line without sinning, without crossing over that line. Instead, you'll see the wisdom of staying back even from the line. You'll see the wisdom in it, and there's wisdom in that. Why? Because you get too close to a line. You look... You look at me like I'm speaking Spanish, okay? I'll park there and preach. 
Okay? You get too close to that line, guess what you're going to do? Anybody, me, human nature. You get too close to, close to the line, you're bound to cross it. Men fall the way they lean. And if you lean toward the world, that's the way you're going to fall. That's why we need standards. And so a command is God says be modest, be distinct, be discreet. A conviction says I will and I should be modest, distinct, and discreet. A confine or a standard says to make sure that I'm modest, discreet, and distinct, I won't wear, and you can fill in the blank. Okay, for our church, we've examined the Word of God for 14 years on this subject, and we've come to the conclusion that instead of pants, a skirt or dress, if not too tight, is a standard that keeps us from violating the convictions that are based upon God's command. So, I'll give you an example. To make sure I'm modest, here's a confine. As a lady, I won't wear pants. Now, if that's not your standard based on your conviction, based on your command, then you need to reevaluate why you're just conforming. Because if not, it won't last. Past cornerstone. I see it all the time. People leave a church like ours, and the first thing the woman does the first thing is put on the pants. It was never a conviction in the beginning. Number four, a choice. Now we're talking about a preference, a choice. This is something that is based largely on emotions and feelings. And this was the problem of the Pharisees. They judge people not based upon commands of God, but based upon their made-up rules. And you know what that's called? Legalism. Now, some people will call me a legalist because I preach on standards. I've just explained why I preach standards. But legalism is saying that a choice, something we have liberty of choice in, saying that that is a command. That's legalism. And that is wrong. I'll give you an illustration. There was a church, true story. I don't know if it was a Baptist church or what kind of church it was. But there was a church that on their bulletin board had posted the restaurants their members could eat at and the restaurants they couldn't eat at. And the ones they couldn't eat at were all restaurants that served alcohol. And what I'm saying to you is that is a good example of how a preference can be made out to be a command and that's very dangerous now if that is your standard I say amen to it I'll never argue with someone for having a higher standard than me that is their liberty in Christ but don't say it's a command okay now we have a pastor that preaches in this pulpit quite frequently and he has if you don't know I'm not going to tell you but um, he will <laughs> If you try to take him to a restaurant where they serve alcohol, he won't go. He won't sit down. And so when we take him out, as we've done in the past, I have to choose a restaurant that does not serve alcohol because that's his standard. And he's perfectly entitled to that. Now, explaining legalism to Christians is like going into your refrigerator, putting your hand into a bowl of jello, grabbing a handful of jello and squeezing it with all your might without any of it squishing from in between your fingers and falling down. It's very difficult to understand that tricky line between legalism and a conviction. But I'll try to illustrate it with math. How many of you like math in this room? Raise your hand if you like. <sighs> Keep it up, I just wanna know my people. I would just want to know who to have do all the math in the office. Okay, 
No, I'm just kidding. Wow, more of you than I would imagine. Wow, I hated math in school. I'm not trying to discourage you students because I had to pass math, okay? But if you love math, this illustration will help you understand legalism a little bit better. Legalism can be either addition, subtraction, or algebra. Addition, I'm having flashbacks. Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you. I'm having flashbacks. Addition. Let's look at the legalism of addition. This is adding to God's word. Adding something that's not there. Take your Bible, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It is legalistic to add to God's word. That's addition. The legalism of addition. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We've never wanted to have the type of church where people just did what they did because the pastor said so. That's a very weak reason to do anything, just because the pastor said so. Now, the Bible does say to obey them which have the rule over you. And so there are some things that I can say, this is how it's going to be under this roof. Okay, I have that authority from God. But you shouldn't just, oh, Pastor Lewis said so, that's why we do it. No, 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 no. Get some convictions. The legalism of addition, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Now, in that verse, I have underlined above that which is written that you shouldn't think of men above that which is written. Now, what's written about men? We're a bunch of filthy, rotten sinners. And the Bible says we shouldn't think of men above that which is written. Now, that idea, just that idea of above what is written, we should not hold to people, hold people to something that is above that which is written and call it a command of God. And to do so is to add to God's word, and that is a form of legalism. The Pharisees were notorious for this. Now, they had a legitimate command to not work on the Sabbath day. But the Pharisees, let me show you how carnal and wicked they were. They taught that you could not spit on the ground on the Sabbath day. You couldn't spit on the ground. Why? Because when spit hits the dust, it, it rolls up the edges of the dust where it lands, and that would be considered plowing on the Sabbath day. And since plowing is work, spitting was considered a violation of the Sabbath day. You couldn't even spit if a fly flew inside of your mouth without violating the Sabbath day. That's the ludicrousness, if that's a word, of legalism by addition. Second, legalism of subtraction. Math students, legalism of subtraction, this form of legalism obeys the letter of the law. They obey the law, but they subtract the godly motivation of love in doing it. Primarily love from God, for, for God, love for God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13 addresses this problem. You say, I thought legalism was just adding to the word of God. No, it can be subtracting. And if you obey and subtract the motivation of love from that obedience, you're guilty of legalism. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Look at verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Man, you can speak well, but if you don't have love, it's a bunch of noise. It's a bunch of noise. 
Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, stop there, prophecy is not just always telling the future. Anytime the word of God is being proclaimed, that biblically is, is prophesying. Man, you can preach. You can understand all ministries, it says, and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Man, you can preach, you can understand the Bible, you could have all this faith, but if you're doing it without love, you are guilty of legalism by subtraction. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Man, you can be a martyr going to the stake. Now that would be a real bummer. You go to the martyr, you go to the stake as a martyr and don't have love in your heart for God as you're doing it and get to heaven and find out that it burn up. Good actions minus love is a legalism that God rejects. Let me bring it home to modesty. Can you see how this legalism by subtraction can be present in the heart of a young woman who desires to be immodest. She desires the attention she gets when she's immodest. But she's got enough sense to obey the rules. Let's say her name is Angela. Angela does not dress immodestly. And the only reason she doesn't is because she knows it's wrong deep down inside. She knows her parents won't let her, and she knows that she can't stay in church ministries if she dresses in modest. She obeys because it is her duty to. Her obedience is not motivated in the slightest by a love for God and a desire to please him. Her obedience is motivated by a desire to stay out of trouble. She's afraid of what her pastor might say, but she doesn't love Jesus enough. That is a young lady that may appear to be modest, but she's got a heart that's very immodest. And that is legalism by subtraction. And third, the form of math I hated the most, algebra. Man, algebra put a whooping on your preacher. And I was in high school, and I knew I was failing algebra. I can't even say it right. Algebra. I was failing algebra, and I had to pass it. God had called me to preach. I had to get off the Bible college where I didn't have to worry about taking math. But I had to pass in order to get through, and Pastor Zdarsky was uh, my ride back and forth to Christian school every single day. And he would take me sometimes before, sometimes after school, and he would tutor me in algebra. And the only way I passed algebra is because I had Pastor Zdarsky as my tutor. There's no way on earth I would have passed that class. I hate algebra. But the idea of legalism by algebra (laughs) is replacement. Replacement. Algebra replaces numbers with letters for different reasons. Okay, having flashbacks. Replaces numbers with letters. Some try to make up for their sin in private by replacing it with good works in public. You hear me? This type of legalism is seen in immodesty at home, but when it's time to go to church or time to go soul winning, then you decide to be ultra modest. Listen, being modest is good, but don't be hypocritical in your modesty. Don't be hypocritical. If it's immodest, if it's immodest in the Sunday school room, why is it not immodest in your living room in in front of your children? Okay, I'm not talking about you and your spouse alone, but I'm saying if it's immodest here, why is it not immodest in your living room? And so, a command. God says, I am to be modest, discreet, and distinct. A conviction. I 
should be, and I will be, a confine. To make sure I'm modest, discreet, and distinct, I won't wear pants, just using an illustration. And here's a choice. Here's where I say we see preference. A good illustration. This is just an example. I will wear culottes. I won't wear culottes. I've got good pastor friends that have the preference of not wearing culottes, and they can tell you why. But if culottes are modest, then we're not violating a biblical principle. Then it becomes a matter of preference. That's your preference. Let's look at some perspectives. An attractive woman who is dressed immodestly, she walks inside of the room. Guys are typically tempted to lust after her. While the woman on the other hand, is typically tempted to act like it's a secret beauty pageant that nobody's talking about. And the woman will envy her appearance or envy the attention she gets from her appearance. Either way, whether it's the man or the woman, it's lust. Women can be very guilty of lust. Clothes are important. You've got three reasons here why clothes are important. Number one, clothes reveal man's faulty attempt to cover himself up with leaves in the garden. If you remember, Adam and Eve tried to use fig leaves. What were they trying to do? They were trying to cover up by their own means. It's a good way to explain to people that we cannot work to be saved. We cannot earn our salvation. There's no way you can cover your own sins. And God showed that to Adam and Eve in the garden. Clothes are important. Secondly, clothes remind us of our sins because something had to die. By violent, sacrificial death, blood had to be shed. God showed that to Adam and Eve when he gave them skins and covered them not with loin cloths of fig leaves, but with aprons, something longer, something more modest. But something had to die. An animal had to die. Now, what was that showing them? That was an early portrayal of the Lamb of God that had to die for us to be covered by his blood. At 33 years of age, my Savior, my Savior was sentenced to die on the cross. And it was a horrible death. A horrible death. He died by being nailed to a cross. The nails were six to eight inches long. They were violently driven through his hands. Some scholars say it was the wrist. The Bible says hands. When we get to heaven, we can look at those scars and know exactly what it was. But he had to struggle to breathe on that cross. It's the Lamb of God. He was in pain, yet courage. And he lost a little over a gallon of his his life's blood until nothing was left but some water to pour out so that my sin could be washed away. And he arose again from the dead. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Third, clothes are to help stay warm. If snow and cold is a part of your winter weather, you understand one reason why clothes are so important. We want you ladies to be warm. And God wants you to be warm. But we, we, we know it's cold. Man, is it cold today. Cold. You don't even want to go to the car. It's so cold. Walk out and it's like you get stuck in midair. It's so cold. Listen, ladies, I say this as your pastor, who, who I am strong in what I believe about the Bible, but I care about you, and I understand you want to be warm, and, and God wants you to be warm. The, the Proverbs 31 woman, the Bible says that they weren't, her household wasn't afraid of the snow because her, her family was clothed in scarlet. God wants you to be warm, but don't you ever use weather as a reason to be dressed wrong. 
Mm -mm. And I want to get specific and give you some ponderings or some warnings. The leggings, in the leggings look, in almost every worldly case would be considered pants. Meaning they would be considered an outer garment. They are worn as outer garments. It takes an outer garment that is typically worn as pants, pants, and makes them an undergarment with skin showing. Now, since they're typically worn as outer garments, as pants, how do you argue that they're not pants? If I wore a skirt under my pants, you couldn't even see it. And then I put my pants on top of the skirt. Okay? I believe the book enough to believe that whether you could see them or not isn't the issue. The issue is, is that I'm not supposed to put on a man's garment. Amen. A woman's garment. Amen. 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 There you go. Woke some of you up. I'm not supposed to put on a woman's garment. The fact that you can see it or not doesn't change the command. Okay? And so if I wore a skirt under my pants, would that be right? No. Number two, where can this leggings look, this leggings look trend lead? Wearing a man's garment, ladies, isn't right because you're at home. We don't say, at our home, we don't say, well, Portia, we're at home. Girls, we're at home so you can go put on your pants. No, because it's based on a conviction, which is based on a command. It's not a preference. I believe with all my heart that that leggings look. You're wearing your skirt. You got your leggings. Okay, you're, you're showing the fact that you're wearing what is typically an outer garment underneath. I believe that will lead to you saying, I can wear them in the house as pants. I believe it'll lead to that. I saw Bible college students get in trouble in the dorm. In the dorm, Bible college, wearing leggings as pants. Don't tell me it doesn't lead to that. I'll only go as far to wear them to the door when somebody delivers a package. It progresses. We're human nature. Oh, I'll wear them out to the mailbox to collect the letters from the mailbox. Before you know it, it can become the legalism of, I wear my skirts to church and my pants to Walmart. So I believe that this trend is preparing women to wear pants. That's what I believe. I believe that as much as I'm breathing, preparing you to revert right back, making it easy. Now you've already got them. You've you already owned them. Third, one sinful motive behind following the world's trends is being a people pleaser, always trying to fit in with the world. Always trying to fit in with the world. Do your clothes show that you are a citizen of heaven or that you're trying to fit in with the world? In the Old Testament, God called his nation Israel to be different. He says, I don't want you like the other nations. I want you to be distinct. Now, girls and ladies are now doing this because they saw, okay, others do it at their old school where it has become commonplace. We think it started with the bus kids in some form or another. In other words, strong church, you don't have those kind of trends. The bus kids come in, you bring them in, and some of them start growing, and some of them start learning uh, they see the other ladies in skirts. All they have is pants, so they put on a skirt over their pants and come to church. Well, I say, who's following who? Who's following who? We want to impact the bus kids, not them be that bad influence on us. So this message is not a rant about preference. Or me saying we're going to impose a conviction in your heart of what you do behind closed doors. All I'm trying to do and all I want to do is describe this leggings look 
as a trendy thing that is going in a direction. A relatively new thing among the strongest of independent Baptists. You need to be careful about your friendships. Careful about who influences you. Careful about that. Not just saying, oh, that looks cool. That looks trendy. I'm going to do that too. Because when that friendship starts, the longer you hang out together, the more you will start to become like that person. No matter what your differences are at the start of the friendship, the longer you stick together, the more you will want to think the way your friend thinks. Act the way your friend acts. That's why the Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. Be careful of who you allow to influence you. Now listen, I don't care how modest you are. The friends you choose is a reflection of where your heart really wants to go. The friends you choose. So in an independent fundamental Baptist church where we try to be modest, it's not so much looking at how you look on Sunday, but who are your friends on Monday? That's where your heart really is. Your associations. And so if your friend is wearing tight skirts and low necklines, you have friends that do not glorify God, and they're wearing what God says is immoral. Don't take clothing tips from the movies that you watch. Movie's not there to teach you how to dress. You better get some wiser influences. Fourth, don't let fashion dictate how you dress. Don't let fashion dictate how you dress. If you do, you're going to spend a fortune trying to keep up with the constantly changing fashions. But more importantly, you'll be imitating the world and not following God's word. The Bible says in James 4.4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That means don't imitate the world. In the world, but not of the world. Don't imitate the world. Fifth, we don't want the leggings look at church. And I will preach about it whenever I see it at church, until it stops. Number six, be careful about being discreet and not being a distraction. Go with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Sometimes a distraction can be a good thing. The idea of a woman being discreet is not being a distraction. Titus chapter 2. Now, do you understand, before I preach, preach is normally more authoritative and drawing a line and just calling for a, a response, a decision. A wise pastor, before he preaches, will take the time to teach. Teach. But once I've taught, I'm prepared to rail on it. Titus chapter 2, verse number 5. Titus 2.5, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Sometimes a distraction can be a good thing, a change of pace. I like a change of pace. To me, a change of pace is a vacation. I could be busier, but if it's a change of pace, it helps me, that distraction, not sitting in the same position. Sometimes a distraction is a good thing. Or, or have, changing the ambience and having some, some uh, godly... Uh, piano music as I was studying and preparing today some godly piano music in the background just to uh, a, a, a good type of distraction but distractions can be bad too there's endless waves of being distracted distractions aren't necessarily wrong but they can be a challenge when you're trying to concentrate on something better and so even if you think something's a good thing Good things become bad things if they keep you away from the best things. Distractions. Drawing attention to your legs is distracting. 
a glimpse of something can get an imagination going. If the leggings are just to be tights so that you can stay warm, if that's or, or more modest, I get it. But why not connect it with the sock? Why not? If, if, it, if that's all it is, then why not? Complete the connection. My girls wear tights. Okay, they don't wear things that they call leggings, but in reality, they're pants. In other words, their tights could not be worn out. Okay, they're not, they're not that way, but they wear them, but there's a foot in them. Or, or at least connect with, with the sock so that you don't have that look. That's all we're asking at church. And I think you, you ought to consider it at home. Yes, Christian men, though, we need to be prepared to respond the right way. Go with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul wanted to help Timothy, who was a man, to deal with distractions when it comes to dress. This isn't a new thing. Okay? A worldly dress has always been a distraction. 2 Timothy chapter 2, or 1 Timothy, rather, chapter 2. Verse number 9, 1 Timothy 2, 9. I'm going to let you get there. 1 Timothy 2, verse number 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Notice what it says in verse number 10 which becometh women professing what? Godliness. What's Paul telling Timothy? You can dress any way you want, ladies. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. You can dress any way you want unless you profess godliness. Did you get that? You can dress any way you want unless you profess godliness. Then you need to be very careful with how you dress. The leggings look is not the direction of discreetness. And I think it's taking those people that do it somewhere. And I think I know where it's taking them. Let me ask you this. Do you spend so much time getting your appearance ready in the morning that you don't have enough time to get your heart ready in the morning? Do you rejoice more about being complimented over your physical beauty than you do over doing a good deed in God's service? Do you use the excuse that I dress more modest than most, so I'm obviously okay? Think about these things. I'm asking you to be courageous. I'm asking you to dare to stand in a wicked world and not just get pushed along with trends. Trends come and go. I'm asking you to be willing to stand alone if need be. I'm asking you to surround yourself with others who desire to please the Lord through modesty. Parents, you should know what's in your kids' closets, and you should know how they wear what's in their closets. We need to be vigilant. Vigilant. Okay, prayer requests tonight. Yes,